um, first of all, thank you very much for a great film. Uh, welcome, Joe Mench, director of the gritty epic Payback. Thank you for your time to answer a few questions for our audience at World of Martial Arts Television. And firstly, my take on it is it's a cool, intense, cinematic, period 80s, 90s film that's reminiscent of Serpico, The French Connection, and more recently, The Irishman. Um, how did you choose to bring all those elements together and put them into this project? Why was this your, what did you, why did you choose this as your directorial debut? Well, um, I've always uh, enjoyed gangster movies and crime dramas more than any other genre. Uh, I was kind of raised on that genre and I was shown uh, The Godfather at a very young age when I was about 11, uh, mm. before I could even understand it. And um, ever since then, I've, uh, I've had this, weird desire to live a different life, uh, preferably a life that has more risk and danger uh, involved with it. And, um, but what I found growing up was that a life of risk and danger has consequences um, that are not necessarily worth all the risk and danger that you go through so what I've discovered is that making movies about people with dangerous lives is about the closest I'm willing to get to actually living that life. Um, so um, the movies that I'm attracted to mostly reflect that kind of life. You mentioned a few of them. Um, I would also throw in uh, Eastern Promises. That was a big influence on this movie. Um, the movie Boiler Room, yep. which is not, not quite a, um, a crime drama, but it's a, a Wall Street drama that kind of dips its toe into that arena. That was a big influence on this movie. And of course, uh, Goodfellas is another one. Um, so yeah, I guess it was the way I was raised and the movies that I like uh, led me to uh, make a movie like this for my, for my first film. So picking up on that sense of uh, risk and sometimes the consequences become a bit unpleasant. Um, this film has a great sense of sort of an unwinding inevitability as in the line, once it starts, you can't stop. Is it a moral tale then with a touch of karma for Mike? You know, when it starts out selling junk stock, which seems quite relatively innocent, innocuous, well it isn't, and it just slides deeper and deeper and deeper, all in pursuit of the American dream. Is it, is it a comment on the American dream or? Is that too overblown? Actually, I think it might be even broader than that. I think it's a comment on revenge, which is uh, something that everyone has felt, I think at some point in their lives, the desire to take revenge, even you know, for the slightest thing. And obviously you don't have to be American to, <laughs> to feel this way. Um, but um, what I was, if, if there's any uh, moral lesson in the movie, it's that the act of revenge often does just as much damage to the Avenger as it does to the avenged. Um, so I was trying to put a spin on the normal revenge movie, uh, which usually treats revenge as a source of relief or, or vindication. Whereas this movie aims to treat revenge more as an addiction, uh, which is both irresistible and self-destructive. Cool. Well, moving aside from the, uh, the, the intensity of the morals and so forth, um, the other thing that struck me is you've got an Australian playing a Russian speaking New Yorker. And yes, he's an actor. How did you get him to pull it off? I mean, he's and is he the next Mel Gibson? So the idea of Australians, R American accent, then it's Ukrainian, Russian. How, how did you get him to be that, play that, that, that role? Is he just a brilliant actor? Well, he is a great actor, first of all, but he did some major preparation for this role. Um, you know, we hired, I hired him about two months before the movie began shooting. And a month before production, he moved to the south of Brooklyn. Uh, he, moved, he was living in LA at the time. 
but he moved he, to Brighton Beach, which is where a lot of this movie takes place and where there are a lot of Russian immigrants, New Yorkers. So he, he moved to an apartment there and we set him up with a bunch of local people there, um, including another actor who's in the movie, the guy Ari Barkhan, who plays his, his friend um, who gets killed. Uh, yeah, so we were, we were able to surround him with both the culture of that area and the language of that area. And over the course of a month, he was able to basically learn the dialect and affect of, uh, of how people talk there. So it was a combination of, of skill and preparation that, that got into that place. Incidentally, Toby Leonard Moore is also an Aussie. Uh, so we had two Australian actors in basically the two lead roles, both playing Russian Jewish immigrants living in Brooklyn. Um, it wasn't planned that way, I promise you, <laughs> but um, Australians have impressed me so much in recent years uh, that I figured it would be no problem for them to, um, to jump into their roles. Did that help um, sort of getting them all to just fluently speak Russian as, as they did? I mean, uh, my Russian's terribly poor, but it sounded good to me. Um, is it, was that sort of an easy thing or was that it also involved a fair amount of um, coaching and so forth? You mean in the scenes where they speak Russian? Yes. So I just dropped into it straight away. Oof, no. Yes, that's right. So there's one scene toward the end of the film where Mike speaks Russian to Pushka, right? Yeah. But apart from that, we only hear little snippets of Russian from Mike uh, throughout the film. Most of the time he speaks English. Yeah. So he, it's, he didn't, thankfully, he didn't need to learn Russian for those scenes. He just needed to learn those specific lines. And we were lucky that the actor he plays opposite in that scene, Lev Gorn, who plays Pushka, he is in fact a native Russian speaker. So Lev was able to coach Mike, uh, or Matt, sorry. <laughs> Lev was able to coach Matt through that scene to make, make sure he was pronouncing those lines properly. But one thing we didn't want to do is lay too much Russian on Matt uh, because, you know, it would have just been, <laughs> uh, you know, too big a deal for him to learn Russian just for this role. I like the way he dropped into it just at those key moments. It was a bit like a, a, a comma or a, to underline certain things. And then otherwise he was American. It was just yes. that bit where he dipped into that culture and then came back up. So it was a, or came, went back out. Not yeah. Back up. No, it, was, it was cool. And it, it felt uh, very, um, it, it, it set the scene for me. Um, so that was, that was cool. Broader question now is, um, what were you, what, what, were you able to apply some of your experience working with uh, Scorsese and Joel Silver to this movie? And if so, what were they? Well, um, in Scorsese's case, uh, I, I learned mostly from his movies. Um, I was a production assistant on uh -huh. Aviator with, uh, with Leo DiCaprio. So I was able for about two months to be on that set and watch Marty work. Now, I learned a lot just by watching him work, um, but more so than that, I learned just by watching his movies. Um, I could tell you though, that on set, what I saw was mostly a very calm, collected man. A guy who kept, kept his heart rate down and was able to just, I don't know, in the midst of this whirlwind that is a movie set, he managed to maintain composure. Now, of course, he had some uh, longtime collaborators around him, making sure that the set had that tone. Um, but I was still impressed by, uh, by how composed he was. Now, um, Joel Silver is a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, he's actually a producer. Um, and a very flamboyant one at that. Um, so I didn't learn too much about 
the skill of directing from Joel. Um, but when I worked for Joel, uh, I was I, I, I got to meet a lot of, of filmmakers and watch movies come together like in the editing room. So that was that was a lot. That was a lot of film school, I would say. Um, and cool uh, film school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the way to learn. I would say more so than film school itself is to actually get on sets and even better than that, direct things yourself so that you can learn all the ways you're going to mess up when you're on set because <laughs> you're going to mess up. <laughs> Does it help you being a producer? And does that and how did that feed into your directing? Were you sort of conscious? I've only got half a day for this. I've got to nail it. Did that ever put you off, or was it quite a fluid combination of the two roles? Um, it was it was a fluid combination because, as you mentioned, I was able to get a sense when producing of the schedule and how absolutely important it is to adhere to the schedule as much as you can. And that's not just for the producers and the actors, that's definitely for the director as well. Um, directors can get themselves in really tight spots by trying to get a scene perfect and then ending up with less time to get the next scene, which they will also want to get to be perfect. And it has a domino effect on the whole day. So it is very important. I learned being a producer, how important it is to prepare as a director uh, as much as possible so that you can shoot the thing as quickly as possible and move on to the next thing. It's also, of course, extremely important to be able to let things go if you need to. Um, you, and I learned that as a producer as well, where there's a certain point, even if you're not getting the perfect shot or the perfect performance, you have to maintain a certain detachment um, and, uh, and realize that the next scene is just as important as the one you're shooting now. And, um, and you, you got to move on sometimes. And I, I learned that being a producer. It's that sense of the schedule. One of the reasons why you chose a sort of handheld -y sort of French style, if you can call it that, but that's um, way of shooting rather than going for sort of set pieces and big moves and cranes and stuff. Um, was that one of the reasons yeah. why you went for it? We tried to keep the uh, cinematography as simple and straightforward as possible. Um, we were going for a, a realistic tone in this movie in the first place, and that allowed more quote unquote realistic camera work. Uh, we didn't have a ton of crane shots or, or helicopter shots or you know, wild cinematography. It was fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, and that made it, I think, simpler to shoot. Uh, we also tried as best we could to limit the number of locations that we shot in, but that was very difficult to do in this case because the script has so many locations in it that the best we could do would be to find as many of the lo those locations in as close proximity to each other in New York City as possible um, in order to save, uh, save time. Um, but yeah, the cinematography, we had to shoot fast. It was a run and gun situation. Well, it looks good. It's got a, it's got a nice sort of gritty uh, raw feel to it rather than being um, I don't know, something like Mad Men where it's, it's recreated the 60s beautifully, but it almost feels it's too beautiful to be there. And this feels like you're dropped in and you're there. So hats yeah. off to you for that. Um, yeah. Which is another thing is with the fight scenes and uh, um, they also felt not overblown and, and, and uh, they weren't sort of shot to be like a, an action uh, martial arts film. They had a real element of or a layer of reality about them. Um, was that also a, a deciding factor because of speed time or just the way you wanted to do it? I think they're very effective as well. Yes, well, that was just taken from the, the story itself and the characters. I mean, these guys, you know, they aren't martial artists, right? They're, they're street guys. Um, so to put them in, the, in a scene together and, and have, having them, you know, do Kung Fu just wouldn't make sense for the story. 
but at the same time, we wanted a really exciting and well choreographed fight scene. Uh, especially the one between, uh, you know, Mike and, uh, and Toby Leonard Moore. Um, so what we did was we hired a stunt coordinator named Tony Vincent, who has worked on several martial arts movies, including um, the John Wick films. Um, and so he got in there and we immediately told him, look, we want a cool fight scene, but we want it to be a street fight not a martial arts, not, not like a trained, you know, elegant kind of fight. We want it to be down and dirty and kind of ugly um, and raw. So he starts, so Tony started with some very clean choreography and we rehearsed with the actors and we got it in a very, very clean, uh, precise kind of way. And once they got that down, I encourage them to forget as though it was part of the script. You know, they say you learn your lines and then forget them. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, learn these moves and then forget them um, so that they come to you in a more natural and spontaneous way. Um, and that was the approach we took uh, with that, um, with that fight. And as you also might notice um, in that fight, there aren't a ton of wide shots, right. you know, there we, we shot it in a very kind of close up, almost claustrophobic kind of way to give it a really uh, gritty and dirty feel. Um, so that's what we went for there. And it helps add to the confusion of the fight because you're not quite sure who's where, where, where which, who's throwing what, <clears throat> which means it, it does have that uh fluid un uh, uh, um, unexpected quality to it, which is, uh, it was it was good. Um, and also the actual, the, the gunfights as well, they were different, the, the shootout, the big one, um, yeah. was nice and just sort of matter of fact. There was no sort of show showboating, it was like boom, boom, and they sort of all day. They died well. They died well, I'm glad you, you think that. You know, what's, what's interesting, what, uh, when, you, when you shoot these, these elaborate shootouts, um, you know, they take a day or two to film and then they end up being 10 seconds long in the movie. Um, so that shootout that I think you're referring to with Pappy on, on the street. Yes, that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, of course, we wanted it to give, we wanted to give it a realistic feel in keeping with the rest of the movie. Um, and it turns out that realistically, that gunfight would take 10 seconds. Um, so it, it, maybe it, it feels real that way because that's just how we were, that's what we were going for. But I, I will tell you that it surprised me in the end um, how quickly that happens. As you're, you're probably used to seeing more stylized uh, gunfights with, you know, with people flying off buildings and and people getting shot in slow motion with, you know, geysers of blood. <laughs> you know, that, that's the stuff that all adds time to these scenes. But if you're going for something as it would really happen, I mean, it would be over in, in a matter of seconds. Uh, so that's what we were going for. Well, yeah, you, you nailed it. You got, it so it got that grittiness. And it was that bit where people just, uh, in the frenetic confusion of it, well, they just died, took hits, died and moved on and fell. And it had a messiness that, of re that added to its reality. So I thought it was cool. And it was refreshingly different as well. It wasn't cool. all a big fall down and you know all the <laughs> fancy uh, aiming and all that sort of stuff. It was just kill or be killed, um, which was cool. Cool, Very I'm glad. Cool. Um, so the next question, because I'm, I'm kind of aware of your time is, um, what's your next film? Well, I am currently developing two screenplays. Um, one of them is a gangster movie. Of course. Uh, yeah. Um, and the other is a Western. Um, I probably shouldn't say too much, uh, but the gangster movie is set in the underworld of sports gambling in India. Wow. Um, so it's a very unique setting. <clears throat> Uh, but the characters are are English, but they are on a mission 
in <clears throat> the underworld of Mumbai. And is it set in, in the present day or sort of? It's set in the present day. Um, the other one is a bit of a departure for me and it's a, it's a Western. Oh, and, cool. uh, it's set in the, uh, like the late 1800s and it's, um, it's a father son narrative. Um, but um, I haven't yet chosen which one to pursue yet, uh -huh. but uh, it's going to be one of those two. Is it one of those things to try and pull in the money for all of them and just whichever co co coalesces first you go for? Or... That mm. is the most effective way to do it that I have found. Um, they call it irons in the fire. Yes. Uh, you know, just get as many things going as you can and uh, one of them will catch fire first and whatever catches fire first, you gotta, you gotta jump on it and do it. And do you nail in a uh, cost to help you get the package together or do you go for the, get the, the, the funding and then go and see who's out there that you wanna cast? Well, I think the more effective way is to get it, get at least the lead role cast first. And if you can cast the lead role with a name actor, mm -hmm. that will attract funding. Yeah. Um, and that's, that applies specifically to where I am in my career. You know, if, if Scorsese goes to Netflix and says, I want to make the next movie, they don't, they don't even care who's, who's in the cast. <laughs> he could cast it with unknowns and that would be fine. Um, but sure. where I am uh, in my career, it is, it is most effective for me to try to attach the talent first before uh, looking for the money. Cool. You did an awesome job. So thank you very much for your time and uh, talking about it. I look forward to the next one, Westerns or, or um, Gangsters. I think you should do all of them um, and many more. And I uh, hope to talk to you about them in the future as well. So. All right. Well, I'd be happy to, Will. And, and, and thank you for having me on, on the show. Well, thank you and uh, look forward to the next one. All right. Have a good one. Cool.